I think we, we did the episode in January or in July of last year. A lot happened after that. Um, but the real stuff that happened was in 2020. Uh, do you remember when you first, like as a human, not as a founder, but just as like an ordinary citizen, started taking COVID seriously? I don't really want to admit this, but I guess I will. I mean, I didn't take it seriously. Um, actually, I'll, I'll tell you, I hope I don't regret this, but um, we were in this unenviable position where we had a new employee starting literally on the day that San Francisco went into quarantine. And, uh, you know, he emailed, he's like, Hey, did you guys know this is happening? Like, what should we do? Um, and I remember thinking we should just ignore this. This is bullshit, right? <laughs> Let's just have them. Everybody should be at work. Make me money peons. <laughs> um, didn't actually really think that, but thought it for a second. And then, uh, you know, I, I intervened um, in, in my own bad thoughts. But um, that, that's kind of where my head was. Like, we didn't know whether quarantine was the right thing. I don't know if it even made sense. And um, I think I was having a hard time adjusting to it. Um, I think I, I took it seriously outwardly from, you know, the day it started happening. And I, I um, right. uh, you know, one of my employees made a really good point, actually. You know, I was bitching. I was like, this is awful. Like, uh, like why where are they thwarting my ability to, to do my job? And he's like, hey, listen, you know, our, our grandparents were drafted and had to go to war. Okay. Like, you just have to stay home. <laughs> I mean, that, that we got it easy by comparison we got it easy so uh, when i heard that it was humbling and i was like you know what dude you're you're right i'm sorry i'm being an ass let's let's take this seriously i mean i think there just wasn't very much information early on to even know how seriously to take it especially january february um i remember being pretty concerned about it like just reading okay there's this disease ravaging china and it's they tried to contain it but now it's out and it's going to spread and it's coming for us and I was just sitting there thinking, like, I'm horrible at being sick. Like, I'm, like, the most pathetic sick person ever. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't want this to happen. Maybe I should take it seriously. But it was hard to predict, like, what the effects should be. Like, what should you be afraid of? Because we just didn't know. Like, is it going to get into the food supply? And am I going to have to, like, start my own garden and grow my own vegetables? Or should I, like, move to a house in the woods? Or, like, a hospital is going to be safe? Like, should I get my medical supplies to store? Like, you just didn't really know how to react. Well, so I don't I, think anyone uh, realized... Yeah, my, my boyfriend's like much more, you know, there's this continuum of preparedness, like, and on, on, you know, one extreme side, you're, you just don't do anything and you, you know, actively like lick doorknobs and on, on the other end is, you know, um, people that are on doomsday preppers, which is this amazing show on National Geographic, if you haven't seen it uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, you should watch it. It's amazing. So, uh, you know, he's, he's more, more, um, toward, toward that. So, uh, I, I kind of felt a little bit um, relaxed about the whole thing because I knew somebody else in the household was doing some of the worrying and that freed me up to be more of a doorknob licker. Although of course I, I wasn't actually <laughs> licking doorknobs, but um, I, I think like one of the ways I felt it more like the stress for me wasn't for some reason I wasn't scared of, of getting sick. Um, I, I should have been probably, but I, I wasn't. Um, I think I was much more scared about, whether my company would survive this, right? Because I'm like, I don't have that much control right. over not getting sick. I'm going to do, I'm going to follow best practices, even though, of course, the CDC seemed to change best practices um, day to day, but did our best. But I'm like, this is something where I actually have agency and control. So I'm going to stress over this instead of this scary big thing, which I don't even know how to wrap my head around. Um, well, I think the challenge with that is if you don't know exactly what the effects will be on the economy and society and just the way we move around. How do you prepare your company for something like that as a founder? You know, you know, okay, we have a tech company, we're helping connect, you know, job seekers and developers to tech companies who are hiring them. But like, there's this pandemic, like what's going to happen, right? Is this going to affect our business? Maybe it'll help our business. Maybe everybody will become a software engineer and everybody will want to hire software engineers or maybe the opposite. So at what point did you like start making plans for your company? Well, I don't, I don't know if like you're this way, you're a founder too. Um, sometimes you can't trust your own brain because um, 
there's this reality distortion field. So one thing that my brain does a lot, which is very tempting to do is come up with scenarios in which case COVID is going to be the key to solving all of our problems. And somehow it's going to make us win over all our competitors and get all this new market share. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> and and that, that can may completely not be grounded in reality, but that's kind of one of the first places where my head went. I mean, uh, one of the sort of, tensions in our business is we we have this recruiting marketplace so on one side you have software engineers that are potentially looking for jobs and then on the other side you have companies that potentially want to hire them um i've always enjoyed the part of our business more that dealt with software engineers rather than so it was like a b2c uh, to b I like the B2C part a lot more rather than the B2B. And one of the main reasons I didn't really like the B2B as much is that I always felt like uh, we had to sell to in-house recruiters rather than um, mm. engineering managers. And, um, you know, there are some amazing recruiters out there, but most of them are terrible. And uh, it kind of sucks to, to feel cynical and full of hate about a good chunk of your customer base. Um, and, you know, generally what happens is engineering managers are very incentivized to make hires because they're like, well, either their, their political uh, power in a company is tied to their headcount or shit, they just need to get things done. <laughs> and they need the headcount to do that or any number of reasons, but they're, they're motivated. Um, in-house recruiters uh, are sort of on the spectrum of very motivated uh, to very unmotivated um, because they're not always incentivized to make hires as much as they are incentivized to keep their job, right? So uh, right. it's one of the differences between selling to a profit center and a cost center, right? In a profit center, if you're selling to them, they just want tools to make them better at their jobs and to make more money. And there's this very direct positive feedback loop. Um, when you sell to a cost center, um, you're, it's kind of muddled and you sort of end up being more incentivized to create tools that make people look like they're good at their jobs. Yeah. And uh, even more directly in a lot of companies, in-house recruiters are compensated in part on commission and they get commission for candidates that they bring in, but they don't get commission for candidates that they get through what are in a broad swath painted as agencies because if a company is already paying a third party some finder's fee to bring in a candidate they're not going to also pay a finder's fee to the recruiter so in-house recruiters have this love-hate relationship with tools and agencies because on one hand they're never making the hires they need to make so they need somebody to help on the other hand that tool can make them look bad or uh can cut into their livelihood so uh long story short um you know I've had this compli I used to be a recruiter as well. Um, and I, I have this complicated relationship with recruiters. But one of my first thoughts was, well, when when COVID hits, uh, potentially, um, there will be fewer recruiters. And then maybe it'll be easier for us to do business or when COVID hits, and this is kind of what ended up happening, we can potentially unlock a new revenue stream, because uh, they're pre COVID engineers, had all the leverage in, in the labor market. Like there's such an engineering shortage that if you're a marketplace that wants engineers in your ecosystem, you can't have any friction to getting them in the door. Uh, you, if you try to like put up a paywall, they're going to laugh at you and all the best people will leave. It's kind of why Facebook um, didn't want to do ads for a long time. And they certainly don't want to charge their users is because the users are the product and they don't have to use you. They can use any number of other things. So interviewing IO was always free. And then I thought, well, post COVID, maybe we'll actually be able, I didn't want to charge users, but I thought, well, maybe we'll actually be able to charge. And then this might set us up uh, for success because other recruiting marketplaces can't charge users because they don't offer them anything of value other than jobs. Right. Um, yeah. There's this, this big switch, I think, from kind of a, running a business in times where the economy is booming versus times where you're just fighting for survival during a recession or where you've lost a significant chunk of your business where you have to question a lot of your assumptions. And in your case, that assumption was we can't charge developers, right? Because they have so many other places to go. And it turns out that like, actually, you probably can. We as can. you said, you're providing real value to them in a way that other platforms aren't. You're not a commodity. You're actually something that people care about. But it, obviously, it took you a while to... to yeah. Well, I mean, when we, when we spoke last year, it was pretty clear that like 
interviewing IO wasn't just some heartless business effort where you found a gap in the market that you could exploit to make money. It's a very meaningful, mission-driven business. And you have so many strong opinions from when you worked as a developer and a recruiter about how hiring is broken and how it doesn't really reflect the realities of who has the power and which engineer should be considered for which jobs. And so when you started interviewing IO, and people who like aren't familiar with their story, I recommend they go back and listen to the last episode we did because it's great. It's such a cool story. But it was very much your attempt to like fix the broken industry and do some good in the world. And you ended up you know, hitting a revenue run rate of millions of dollars a year in the process, which is pretty cool when you can have both of those things. Uh, but obviously, COVID destroyed your business model as it existed. <laughs> Completely. Yeah. I mean, it was... So we used to make all our money from employers, right? So companies would pay us, despite me kind of complaining about recruiters, in many cases, they were great to work with and they were kind enough to pay us money. And... Uh, we'd make, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per hire in many cases, or our larger customers would pay us six figure subscriptions for say a year of candidate flow. Um, then, and I, I love this because I don't want to charge engineers. Like I am trying to, to fix their lives and companies are kind of paying for it. And everybody thought that was okay. Then all of a sudden, um, COVID hits, right. And all of these employers that have big subscriptions with us, come to us and they're like, hey, we're just going to pause. It wasn't even, hey, um, our renewal is coming up in six months. Let's use up what we have and we don't know if we're going to renew. It was just, we're just not going to use you for a while and we don't know when we'll be back. And 75% of our revenue came from these deals. So that was already extremely alarming. Uh, it became pretty clear that we would not be able to renew these on schedule, if ever. Um, and then the remaining 25% of our revenue came from smaller companies that didn't have the budget to maybe commit to these large deals or have the headcount to, to need the amount of volume we were serving, but still used us serendipitously for hires when they needed them. And there they pay us this, you know, 15% typically finders fee. And those small companies were, I think, hit harder in a lot of ways than the large ones because in some ways they, they have less runway, they have less certainty. So they're at customer, it was like this, um, uh, normal distribution, right? So <laughs> first there's this trickle of, of pause, a very apologetic pausing, right? And, you know, maybe we're getting one every few days and, you know, we're girding our loins because we know the big, <laughs> the big spike is coming. And then all of a sudden companies are canceling like, multiple times a day. And, and uh, in a matter of weeks, we went from millions of dollars <laughs> to basically zero. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like all our big customers paused and then, you know, we had a few left on contingency, but those, you don't know when they're going to make a hire. <laughs> you can't build a, a business around that. Um, so it was, it was very, very scary. Um, and uh, probably the most stressful time professionally in my entire life. So I had a, a conversation with Vincent, which you listened to a few weeks back and we talked about, you know, what motivates founders kind of on the negative side, like what are you worried about? Who do you feel obligated to? And a lot of people will become founders because they think, oh, it's just going to be this big, happy journey of total freedom. I don't answer to anybody. I'm my own boss. Uh, but the reality is you kind of answer to your employees and obviously your customers and your partners and co-founders. You might even have, may even have investors who you don't want to let down. And of course, you have your own expectations for yourself. You know, you're like, hey, Aileen, you said you're going to do this and it's going to succeed. And then suddenly out of nowhere, you're staring at like the potential end of your company. Yeah. I mean, what do you think or who do you think it was that you were the most worried about letting down and the most worried about, you know, interviewing IO failing? Um, I mean, it was hard because uh, normally you have, if you're not doing well, you have some amount of time to adjust to the new reality and everything was, was sped up. Right. It's like, um, this is maybe not an apt comparison, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. It's, you know, when a loved one dies in a car accident versus from a drawn out terminal disease or both are horrific, but in, in one you're completely blindsided and in the other you, you have time to, to practice grieving. Um, and, uh, here it was, it was much more like the, the car accident. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've been doing this, uh, doing this company for over five years, but I've been angry at recruiting and hiring and how the status quo works for much longer than that. I was a recruiter for, uh, ran my own firm and 
was head of hiring at a few companies. So I've been in this space for almost a decade and that's been my whole life. So I think that the person or entity I was most afraid of disappointing was myself because I was scared to look through the other side and be like, okay, well, I don't have this. Who am I now um, without this, this company? And um, one of the things I, I saw this comment on Hacker News where uh, somebody was talking about some company shutting down and some, one of the top comments was, well, maybe they were doing shitty before this and COVID is just a convenient excuse for everybody to save face. And then I started thinking, well, what if everybody thinks that about interviewing IO? And then more broadly, right? Um, I, I've always believed that hiring should be about connecting smart people at scale. It shouldn't be about middlemen. It shouldn't be about, you know, resumes, all these things that I think a lot of your listeners probably viscerally find frustrating and why hiring feels like it sucks, right? I believed sort of axiomatically that if given, if, if we can just fix a few things, it's going to work. And then I'm like, well, what if, what if we never get to fix these things? Or what if my whole worldview is wrong? Or what if I never get the chance to prove it? Because market forces are now against me. And, you know, a lot of <laughs> success is about timing. So definitely me. Um, after that, my employees, um, you know, I, a lot of them uh, are, you know, the engineers, I thought, okay, they, they will have the easiest time finding another job, but maybe not, right? We didn't know what a post-COVID economy would look like. Some of these people have kids. Some of these people have mortgages. And, um, you know, I, uh, I didn't know how I could look them in the eye. Um, and some of them, you know, for non-engineers, finding a new job tends to be a little harder. Uh, so that, that was horrific. My investors, I was kind of least worried about. I figured they'd, they'd understand. And, uh, you know, one thing you learn as a founder, at first you're like, oh, my God, all these people gave me money and now it's on me not to lose it. And then you realize they give a lot of people money and most of those people lose their money. So they're probably okay with it. Not to be too cavalier, but not as worried about them as about my own like identity and, and <laughs> right. uh, mental health and, and certainly the livelihood of my employees. Yeah. Your investors are rich. They'll be, they'll, they'll, they'll be fine. Be okay. But Well, I mean, again, post COVID who a lot of these things we assume like in, in, in the early days, I'm like, well, is this going to be the great depression? Is it going to be worse than the great depression? Is, right. is this going to be, um, like that, that show on HBO I've never seen where some portion of the population is raptured. <laughs> I don't know. Could be, could be any of those. It could be anything. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> and I think in situations like that, the, the fear like, of the unknown is so much worse than the actual pain. Yeah. Right? When you don't know where the bottom is, you just construct all sorts of mental simulations of, okay, like what could go wrong? Whereas you know, the situation you're facing today in this instant might not be nearly that bad. How... Like, what kind of time scale is happening in your mind for when the end might come for interviewing IO? Was it just like one day you're like, you know what, we're dead? Or was it over the, a few weeks you're like, you know what, we've got six months of runway left and we've got to figure it out? Well, the, the beauty of these things, um, unlike in life, in most company, in most cases with, with uh, running a company, you know exactly when you're dead because you know how much money you have left, right? Hopefully. <laughs> uh, hopefully. Uh, as a human, you know, you could be dead at any, I could drop dead in the middle of this interview. You probably won't, but it, it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> let's hope I don't but I would mourn you Aileen thank you um you'd be one I of would the still few publish that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hope you would <laughs> can you imagine what that would do for my download numbers I think it would be better if it were somebody famous uh, but <laughs> 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 um, all right this is getting dark. too dark um so uh you know we kind of knew when we'd be out of cash um and there is like, when you think about your runway, there is, well, there, here's our runway. If we keep in bringing roughly the same amount of money we have been, um, assuming you're not profitable, which you know, many startups are not, we, we were not. Um, and then there is like your, oh my God, we're fucked runway where it's like, there is no more cash as of today. And that is a lot shorter than, you know, the runway you generally think about because you make some assumptions about how the world will be. Um, so, you know, we were, uh, I won't mention exact numbers because uh, I probably shouldn't, but like, it wasn't good. It, it wasn't good. Um, uh, fortunately, um, you know, in, in our case, like it wasn't that hard to think of what we could do 
because we did have this valuable thing we were offering people. So I think anybody in our situation would have thought, okay, well, what do we have that we can sell? Okay, well, we have these free anonymous mock interviews with engineers from top companies. This is the reason people are using our product. But um, sort of, it was kind of easy to make that decision um, because we had no other choice. We, uh, we would have right. shut our doors and then nobody would get interview practice of any kind, or at least, you know, um, not, not at the caliber that we were giving it, but, um, it was, it was a hard thing, I think, to tell our users. And it was also a hard thing to accept, right? You do a lot of things out of necessity, but that doesn't mean that you're happy about them or that you're proud of them. And so, so before we get into the exact details of what you did, let's remind listeners of how interviewing IO works. I yeah. touched on it earlier, but as a developer, like what's your experience when you come into interviewing IO? Mm-hmm. So most of our users come to us um, because they're either in the midst of a job search or they're thinking about their next job search. And uh, across the board, they're kind of disgusted and terrified in equal measure of uh, undergoing a standard algorithmic technical interview. Um a lot of our users are maybe senior engineers and they just haven't done this stuff in a while because it's not what you do at work. Some of them are juniors. Uh, maybe this is their first exposure to technical interviews. But either way, whether you're junior or senior, you're like, oh my God, I have to reverse a binary tree. Fuck. Okay, what do I do? Right. Um, some of our users go on like leak code first and um, uh, muck around on there a little bit. And then uh, they come to us because... Uh, talking to another human and having another human breathe down your neck while you're doing the aforementioned binary tree reversal is a very different experience. So uh, if you're one of our users, get on the platform and um, before, before COVID, you set up a pseudonym because everything's anonymous. And then you just see a bunch of times and you click a time. And then when you show up, let's say on Wednesday at noon, there's going to be an engineer from a thang or comparable company maybe you know we have some non-fang interviewers like dropbox and slack and uber and lyft and you know but their bar is comparable um and then you meet that person in uh a a version of coder pad (laughs) inside our product um and they run you through a very realistic um algorithmic or systems design interview uh you can't see them but you can hear them And then at the end, they give you actionable feedback and also uh, tell you where you stack up. Um, So, you know, uh, for a lot of people, it's it's a way of getting your feet wet. Um, But either way, you know what you need to work on and you break the seal and then you keep practicing. Um, Then if you do well in practice, uh, and this is, uh, it's a bit of a moving goalpost, but some top percent of our users, uh, then instead of having to apply online or, talk to recruiters or update your resume or get a friend to refer you, which is potentially dicey and also doesn't help you that much. You can just click a button and have an interview with uh, any number of great companies as early as the next day, uh, which is also anonymous. So if you screw that up, the company doesn't know who you are. And if you do well, you get fast tracked and go to onsite. Um, So that's, that's, which is just so smart because as engineers, I think these emotions are very real. Like in the same way that your identity as a founder is tied to your company as an engineer, like it sucks to go into an interview and have people know who you are and just completely bomb it and feel like a failure. And this thing you've been studying for practicing for years, like you're not good enough. And someone tells you you're not good enough. So it's you, awful. Site, you could, you could practice and practice anonymously and get better. And like a low stake situation is so smart. And when you launch this thing, well, really, when you just launched like the sort of landing page for it, because you hadn't built it yet, you got something like 7,000 signups in one day yep. on Hacker News because people really, really wanted what you were building. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, I didn't think it would do anything. And then that happened. And then I was like, all right, time to quit my dumb recruiting job and actually start this company. <laughs> um uh, so I, I think we, we do add a lot of value for engineers, you know, for some of them, it's the practice piece for some of them, it's just getting fast tracked at employers, but that's what we used to do. Um, and as I mentioned right. earlier, it was completely free for engineers. We did limit how many interviews people could do because we still had to pay our interviewers. Uh, but you know, I think you got, you got at least three generally, uh, and potentially you could unlock more by doing various things on the site. Um, and then employers paid us for hires. Now, 
post COVID, all of that, all of that changed um, very, very fast. Yeah, you had to sort of become uh, almost like a brand new founder, a brand new indie hacker, where you're like, our business model no longer works. Yeah. Because the people paying us money are no longer hiring or paying any money whatsoever. Like, what are we going to do? Um, I'm curious about this, like how you approach this, because a lot of people listening in are trying to figure out how to come up with an idea. And they might not have had the same advantages that you had. Like, you already had a huge user base, you already had a lot of momentum, you already had a team. But still, I mean, it's not immediately obvious, 100% clear, like what idea is going to work once your old business model stops working. So uh, how did you approach approach figuring out you know, how to save the company when you realized that you didn't have a lot of runway and like you weren't going to be able to make money the way you always had? Yeah. Um, so uh, a few things. Um, one of the first things I did uh, was go, to, and this is maybe not the first thing I should have done, but this was something that at least I knew like could could work was I went to one of our engineers. I was like, can you just look at Stripe this weekend and see how it works? So like, we need, we're going to need payments. <laughs> okay. So you figure that out. Now, while, while you figure that out, um, I am just going to email our users. And uh, basically, um, the way interviewing IO worked before is um, we had a good amount of, you know, tens of thousands of users, but then we also had a very, very long wait list. So uh, our wait list consisted of folks that um, were either outside the U.S. because we were generally operating in the U.S. or um, engineers that we didn't think we could place. And the reason for that is, you know, we're paying for their interviews. So we had to have some reasonable expectation that we could make that money back. Now, uh, many other players would say that these are people that didn't go to top schools or top companies. We didn't look at that at all. We didn't care um, what their LinkedIn or their resume looked like. Instead, what we cared about was, are they senior? And, um, you know, are they actually a software engineer? Like, those were the main things. Um, that means that we had um, a lot of juniors on our wait list. We also had um, folks that weren't in our target markets on our wait list. Um, so I started uh, sort of going through um, some of our waitlisted users, uh, and asking them if they could, would like to get off the waitlist, if they could potentially pay for interviews. And this email took me, the first draft took me so long because I, I felt like I wanted to pour my heart out and apologize to them and explain that, you know, we're fucked in the wake of COVID and we have to do something. Um, we took the whole team, like helped me edit it. it we kind of got it down to something manageable. And I would just start sending out these emails to folks on our wait list um, while we still, we still continue to let people on because we didn't know how long this would last. And I didn't want to just stop our candidate uh, flow to, to the companies that were still hiring. So we're, we're still sort of hemorrhaging money on one side, but we're, we're testing out this thing. So just emailing users and just offering them different price points. And I started a spreadsheet and uh, just tracked email open rates, email response rates. And then we did this very, very janky thing. And um, some users are like, are you are you a person? Are you scamming us? Because we literally just had a PayPal link. It was like PayPal me slash interviewing IO or something. And we're like, <laughs> okay, um, if you want to, great, you want to get off the wait list and you're willing to pay, cool, um, send money here. <laughs> and we saw if they'd actually send money there and they did. Um, so we thought, well, if people are willing to trust us and send money to this janky link, then probably if we built payments and what this wasn't all over email, it, it's not a, a crazy assumption that, that this would work. Um, so we tried a few different price points. We had no idea what to charge. Uh, we kind of knew what market rates were for, for some of these things, but that felt a little too expensive. So we, we, we tried any number of, of um, things. One of the interesting things we discovered in the process was that our users tended to be kind of bimodal in their approach. Um, there are some portion of people for whom, you know, paying between 100 and 200 some dollars an interview, depending on uh, what the interview was, was no problem. And they'd buy multiples. And that's one, one hump in the curve. And then the other one was users that are all the way at the other end. And at most, they'll pay 10 or $20. And there weren't that many people in the middle. Um, but this is you know, literally like every morning I'd wake up and be like, who signed up? Um, who got waitlisted? Who can I reach out to? Eventually, we stopped doing free interviews entirely because we realized COVID wasn't a blip. And this is our new reality. And then 
we just emailed everybody that signed up basically the day before that was in the US saying, hey, um, we have a wait list. Do you want to skip the wait list? This is how much it costs per interview. And then we started trying different offerings. So we saw that um, a lot of our users wanted not just a practice interview, but a practice interview with a Googler or with an engineer from Facebook or with an engineer from Amazon, either because they already had interviews at those companies or because aspirationally, that's where they wanted to be. So much good stuff there that I want to ask you about. But this like scrappy process you're going through where you're you know, the founder and you're actually taking the time to email users and send them this like janky PayPal link because nothing's set up. Uh, that's what I mean about going back to square one and becoming kind of like a brand new indie hacker, even though you had a mature business. And I'm curious, like, how did you do that when you had a team behind you? Like, How aware was your team of how dire the situation was? Were they worried? Or is this just sort of you doing this all by yourself and hoping your team doesn't find out that like you might be screwed? No, we, um, they, they knew. Um, uh, one of the things I think that founders can underestimate just in talking to founder friends of mine is how perceptive and plugged in employees are, right? They can tell. I mean... They can tell your mood. They can tell everything that's going on. So I, I've taken um, an approach where I just tell my team what's going on um, because if not, they'll, they'll know. Um, I've made some missteps in the past where I haven't told them what was going on and then something that some grand plan I have didn't work out and it ended up right. affecting them and it blew up in all our faces. So after you know uh, learning the hard way also, I just, I just stopped and I, I just tell everybody. I, um, you know, we have a graph where uh, I shared this with the whole company. I'm like, this is our burn. Um, this is how much money is coming in. These are our projections. These are the assumptions I'm making in these projections. You can see exactly the month in which we're gonna run out of cash. And then you can also see um, how our revenue numbers are changing as we try different things. And this was shared. Not everybody spent time looking at it. Some people did. Um, but this way it's all out there. Um, my, my ops team was really helpful in doing some of these as I figured out like the first iterations I did myself because I had no idea what I was doing. Right. So I, I wanted to kind of get a feel for how to do this before, um, delegating it to others, but people helped with copy. And then, you know, as we jumped in, the rest of the team, um, also helped with testing in parallel, you know, my engineer got, got Stripe working, which wasn't hard of. <laughs> um, and then after that, uh, we started, even before I thought we needed it for sure, um, we started building a prototype for um, paid interviews. And, uh, you know, in some ways we were lucky because we already had a lot of product built, but there are a lot of UI changes that we needed to make and UX changes that we needed to make how do we explain to users that this is our new model in the UI without writing a giant essay? Um, how do we show them all of these different options? Um, do we uh, roll our own order management system or do we use something like Shopify? Um, do we, you know, there, right. there are all of these and uh, let's, I need help with projections, like reasonably, <laughs> um, how much revenue can we expect from, from this in the best case? Um, so uh, it was definitely after after I found my sea legs a little bit. Um, it was definitely a, a team effort, and um, some folks on the team had much more experience with consumer businesses than I did, and pricing than I did. So um, it was critical to lean on them. I think I would have done the company a disservice if I had tried to go it alone. And I can't imagine it was easy to decide on this business model where you're going to charge your developers because yeah, they I are mean, the product. Maybe that was the obvious. I mean, yeah, they're the product. <laughs> Maybe that was the obvious approach, right? Because you have all these developers who are getting all this value for free. But I mean, you literally used to say at the top of your website, practice interviewing with engineers from Google, Facebook, et cetera. Yeah, it's free and always will be. Yep. And in a way, that's like a promise to your customers. Like, hey, we will not charge you. Yeah. And if you go to the Wayback Machine, you'll see it's there. And we... I'm looking at it right yeah, now. Yeah, right. And we inadvertently, you know, lied. Um, you know, one of the, the guy that started on the day of the quarantine, I think like his first, so our, the first, um, sort of onboarding task that every engineer, I think everybody at the company does is, um, we have this corpus of pseudonyms where we have like an adjective and a noun, and then it just puts them together. So, you know, you can be like monstrous penguin or, you know, uh, nihilistic defenestration, which was my handle for, for a long time. Um, but 
your first commit is usually adding to that corpus. So you like add a funny adjective and you add a funny noun. So after that one, um, his first commit was um, like, hey, find all references to free and can you like remove them? <laughs> Which was really like, it, it felt so shitty. It felt shitty for me. It felt shitty for the team. Um, but I think we all knew that it was either this or we're dead. So I guess we're going to do this and we're just going to try to be honest about it and own what we're doing and hope that our users forgive us. This is another difference between starting a company in sort of booming economic times and a time of recession and just fighting for survival, right? Like the booming times are like, hey, we're offering all this value, but it's free, you know, and here's all these promises that we don't need to make, but we're going to make and everything's good. And then the hard times are like, this promise is rescinded. We are charging. It is X dollars a month, take it or leave it. Like we need to actually survive. Yeah. And like, that's what you have to do as a founder because if, you, if your company shuts down, like you can't even keep your original promise, right? You can't provide a free service if your company doesn't exist. Uh, but were you afraid of how users might take that? Because people on the internet are sort of, especially developers, can be ornery. Yeah, uh, extremely. excited when companies charge money for things that were previously free. Extremely afraid. Um, I think I was afraid of two things. I was afraid, one, of just people hating us and then also hating me. Um, you know, a lot of what I love about my job is that, you know, it's, it's awesome building for engineers. They're like the best users um, because you admire them, right? You're like, wow, these people are building things themselves and it's cool to build things for builders. And they're insightful, right? And they're solving a lot of the same problems at work that you're solving. So in some ways they have a lot of empathy for, they're like, oh, I see you guys are AB testing this thing. Like they, they get it, right? They peel back the curtain and they kind of understand what's going on. And um, they have strong opinions and they'll tell you. And, and you know, the bug reports people submit are beautiful because they're super detailed. And like, I, I love building for, for these users. And one of the things I love about my job is that engineers like us generally right and they by extension like me and then i was like what if what if this is it right what if this is the 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 blow from which we will never recover um part of me thought well look as long as you're still adding value some portion of people will use it because it doesn't matter if people love you or your brand at the end of the day what matters is are you giving them something that they want and no matter how great of a brand you have if you're not doing that that's temporary they're going to leave so um, that was scary, though, because I, 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 I expected a lot of blowback. And in some ways, what sucked, too, is uh, I had sold a lot of people on this vision of how hiring should be, kind of alluded to that earlier. And was this a big capitulation? Like, no, actually, um, hiring isn't going to be the way we want. And we have to charge these people that we never wanted to charge. So really scary. Um, like I said, the whole team jumped in and helped me edit this um, almost tearful email to the community about what was going on. And it was extremely well received. Um, I, I was so grateful. I was shocked first and foremost, but then I was extremely grateful that people understood. But I think Reed one Hawkins of, one of the things, recently. Oh, sorry. Like one of the things that I think made it better is we decided like, even if we're charging, we're still going to have some kind of free tier. Right. And we to this day have a tier where um, you can interview other users and they'll interview you. So it's a sort of peer to peer thing. Um, mm. And I think that that helped soften the blow a little bit, but also it helped us kind of continue this mission of like, if somebody can't pay, like they, they should still be able to get some help. Um, so we, we did that and uh, that made me sleep better at night. And I think it, it helped some portion of our users that it would have been probably upset otherwise, even if the quality of, of those interviews is, is more um, uh, up and down uh, and, and less predictable than, than a professional interviewer. I think when people, you know, maybe the analog to this that I know that's closest is just raising prices. So often founders have similar fears as yours. Like people are going to hate me if we raise prices and we've always charged X dollars a month. You know, how can we really justify charging twice as much? And then people do it. And every now and then, you know, you get some hate emails and some negative reactions and some angry tweets. But like, by and large, if you're providing value to people and it's worth the cost and people understand why you're doing it, you're not just trying to like squeeze some extra money out of them, but like you're facing certain death and a global pandemic or like you've hired more people and you're providing more features. So now you need to charge more to support the team. I think usually customers understand. And when it comes to making a promise as explicitly as you did, you know, it's free and always will be. 
Uh, I was thinking about a quote from Reid Hoffman recently where he said, the only cr- promise to customers that you can't break is giving them the value that they need you know, for a price that they can afford. That's a really good quote. Yeah, I think it's it's so true. And so, you know, obviously it worked out in your favor. Things have sort of turned around. Uh, how how well are you doing now? You know, you were millions in revenue before. You lost pretty much all of it practically overnight. How well did this new change work? Um, well, what was crazy is so we, we shipped um, the first version of paid interviews in a real way where it wasn't just me emailing people being like, please, sir, can I have some money at this PayPal link? Um uh, we shipped in in May, and I think in in a matter of like six weeks, we went from nothing to a million dollar run rate, which crazy, like unreal. Um, <laughs> so like I, I'm still shocked that that happened, and I'm so grateful that our users were were willing to do that. Um, we also had to change. You know, we used to pay our interviewers more than we're paying them now. Um, so I'm I'm very grateful that they were kind of willing to to take that hit and that you know we there were more people that were willing to be interviewers, but um, yeah that 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 was unreal and um, you know I I didn't really sleep well for for months and then I remember when we kind of got close to a million which we're still not profitable but we once we got there I I had the first good sleep I'd I'd had in a long time we're now um, close to where we used to be um, and uh, we're we're growing pretty steadily month over month. Um, uh, some months are, are crazy high. Some months it's just a little bit of, of growth, but every month is better yeah. than the last. That's crazy how fast you had that turnaround. And it just goes to show how much unlocked potential that you had sitting there on your waiting list pretty much this whole time. Yeah. Uh, is there any part of you that regrets like not doing this earlier? Like last year, pre-pandemic, like do you, if you could go back in time, would you have you know charged developers? That's a really good question. The answer is that I don't know. And in fact, um, our data scientist came to me with this like really well thought out presentation where he's like, look, we clearly have product market fit on the practice side. Um, companies, yeah, we're like making more money than we probably would be from candidates, but it doesn't feel like a machine. Um, right. We should charge. And I disagreed with him. Um of course, once this happened, I went to him kind of apology hat in hand, being like, hey, dude, you know, I think I think you might have been right about this. But the fact is, I don't know, right? Because um, so much of our behavior is shaped by market forces. And I think one of the reasons people are more willing to, maybe they're not, maybe the, I think some portion of our users would, would always have paid, right? But I think the hard thing uh, when I thought about it before was, how do we decide who is going to get the service for free and whom we're going to charge? Um, and that, that didn't seem like a question that had a good answer, right? Um, very pragmatically speaking, um, if we were to charge before, we'd say, okay, candidates that have no trouble getting jobs and have a lot of network and, and you know, um, have friends with whom they can practice and already have a good job, we can give this to them for free. And people that really need this, we should charge them. But that felt gross. And I just like didn't want to do that. And then if we charged everybody, we would probably scare away the users whom we needed most, right? Um, A lot of misconceptions around interviewing IO are that our whole platform is junior engineers. And especially um, even now, it's really hard for juniors. Pre-COVID, it was extra hard for juniors to get jobs. And when we went to sell to employers, they'd always say, oh, well, we don't want to pay for junior engineers. And then we'd be like, wait, wait, no, no, no. Like, our average years of experience is around seven, right? Most of our engineers are senior. About 60% of them are already at top companies. 40% of them, you probably wouldn't hire based on their resume. And our value is in, you know, getting you those candidates and then making you feel bad that you previously rejected them. But, um, you know, if, if, uh, if we try to charge, a lot of our users, I think, would just not pay. But post-COVID, as I mentioned earlier, the sad thing is there are more candidates competing for fewer jobs. And that has changed the dynamic. Um, so I, I don't feel so great about that. But one of the ways I've tried to resolve charging people in a time when they need help the most is we've created some scholarships and um, some fellowships, uh, which which I hope we can expand. And, you know, we'll just as long as we stay alive, um, I will I will always do what I can to make sure that we're we're not unfairly treating people that, that can't pay us. I mean, figuring out who to charge and how much to charge them is just another problem that I think indie hackers run into when they first start their businesses. And with you, you had this interesting dynamic where it seemed like some people, as you said, over email 
but willing to pay hundreds of dollars to find a job. And some people like really didn't want to pay that much to do interview practice. And I, I think one of the cool things about the whole space that you're in, the hiring space, is that there's just so much money changing hands, which is indicative of how much value there is. I tell founders all the time, like if you're not sure what industry to be in, like <laughs> ideally pick an industry that's like the intersection of something that you love and also something where like people clearly find things valuable because they're paying lots of money for things. And with you, it's on both sides. Companies pay software engineers so much money per year to hire them. It's it's like their lifeblood to have talented software engineers. And so they're willing to pay recruiters a lot of money or agencies or companies like yours a lot of money to help them hire. But also people who are learning to code or people who are trying to get jobs. Like that's a transformative event to get a job at a company that's going to pay you a high salary as a software engineer. And so if there's a platform that helps you do that, like if I'm going to get a job that's going to pay me six figures, I'll probably be willing to shell out hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to make that process more guaranteed. So I guess what I'm curious about is what was the difference between the people who were willing to pay you, you know, $200 a month or whatever it was for interview practice versus the people who are only willing to pay like 20 bucks a month? Yeah. So it's, it's not per month. It's, um, it's per interview. Uh, okay. So you just kind of pay as you go. The people that... Even better. Yeah, right. Um, you just use what you want and you don't use what you don't want. Um, I think that there is definitely at, at uh, a high level, uh, senior engineers tend to be more willing to pay than juniors. And people who still have a job are more willing to pay than people who've been laid off. So if you just cut the audience um, that way, you're probably going to get like 80% of, of the, the truth. Um there's, uh, there's some skeptics, right? There are some users whom I talked to when I was doing user research and they're like, yeah, I have the money. I just don't know if I want to spend it on this. Um, so one of the things that we started thinking about was, well, how can we de-risk this purchase, right? How can we make it so people do the practice that they need and then pay us once they get a job? And we actually, we rolled out a V1 of what we call financial aid recently where uh, you can defer payments until you find a job and as long as it takes you is that's as long as it takes. But um, one of the things I found really surprising um, in my user research is people are like, yeah, I would totally pay for this. Like, yeah, it's amazing. I can practice with a Googler. I pay like 50 bucks a month for that. And maybe I can get three interviews. I'm like, do you know how much an hour of a Googler's time is worth? <laughs> a lot more than <laughs> a that. A lot more than that. Um, so, uh, you know, there's definitely that, that mismatch, but um, I think it's pretty, pretty cut and dry. Like if you have a steady income and um, you, it's a high amount because you've been in this industry for years, you'll pay. And if not, then maybe some college students can pay a lot of money. Um, some, some can't, most can't. <laughs> so what do you think was your biggest uncertainty after you unveiled this new plan and users seemed like, you know what, this is okay. We'll pay for this. Uh, what was like your remaining uncertainty that this might not work? Yeah. Um, so, it was easy to, I mean, not easy, but like we were able to get some portion of our users paying immediately. Right now, the thing we're struggling with is uh, growth, right? So how do we get more than X percent of users um, to buy something? And the more you do this, of course, the harder it gets because you've exhausted some of the lower hanging fruit. Um, so one of the cool things about this actually is that it's turned our culture into much more of a culture of experimentation. Before, uh, when we made changes to our product, our sort of uh, north star was how many um, how many hires are we making, and the latency between an engineer signing up for interviewing IO and an engineer can get a job is significant. So, you know, three to six months on average. So, running any kind of A/B tests or new offerings for users uh, wasn't very expedient because it took forever to see any kind of result and. All, the other reason is it's a funnel. So by the time, no matter how many users you have at the top, by the time you get to the point where people are finding jobs through you, there are a lot fewer, which means that it takes longer um, to, to see results if things are, are close. So um, now the feedback loop is much tighter because somebody gets on the platform and then they buy something or don't typically in a day or two. Most people buy the first day they're on. So uh, we can start doing all sorts of weird stuff and running experiments and seeing what's going to work and what's not. Um, but it does get harder. Like once you've sort of maxed out on the low hanging fruit, what do you do next? And one of the things we're going to start thinking about is growth, right? 
A, our, our unit economics are pretty good now. So how do we get more people in at the top? Maybe funnel hacking is not the right thing to do anymore. And we just need more people. But that's a tension that we're dealing with internally. Yeah, user acquisition, I think, uh, often people see these graphs of, you know, Facebook's growth or like any like, you know, rocket ship startups growth. And it's just like up and to the right, like a perfectly smooth curve. But the reality is often there's plateaus and you figure out things that work and then you sort of exhaust that channel and you've got to go back to the drawing board and figure it out again. And I remember last year when we spoke. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say like a lot of the time you also looking at those graphs, you don't know where that growth came from. Right. And you don't know if it's ROI positive growth, not to be super cynical, but when we did paid marketing for, for a time, our growth numbers went through the roof, but that's not necessarily a win because, you know, are you making money per user or not? Um, and sometimes right. when you're running a startup, it doesn't matter because like people just care about engagement metrics, but in this climate, we're all about revenue. So we have to be a lot more careful um, with uh, things like paid marketing, even though we're probably going to start doing that soon. But um, when you see those graphs, there's generally a lot more going on under the hood uh, than, than first meets the eye. Yeah, I think that's just, you know, it speaks to the times. Like recession, Aileen has got to think about revenue and got to think about keeping expenses low. And when we spoke last year, you're telling me about like how you spend your day as a CEO. And you said, well, I spend a lot of time thinking, a ah. lot of time hiring, oh, <laughs> a God. lot of time writing. <laughs> how has that changed this year? Oh, oh to be pre-recession Aileen again. Um, well, um, these days I spend a lot more time in spreadsheets and looking at revenue and projections. Uh, also looking at A-B test results, right? Um so I'm, I'm in a much more kind of product analyst role than I used to be before. Um, I definitely not spending much time on hiring. Uh, we're, we're, the team is the way it is and it's lean and, and we're going to work our asses off and, and stay the way we are until we hit profitability. Um, but I think the writing thing is still important. Um, I've written a couple of things since uh, the pandemic started and I'm working on another piece. Um, I think like content marketing for us has always been such a great thing. And now more than ever, um, I find myself wanting to communicate with our users uh, because I, I want them to understand where we're coming from and why we're doing the things that we're doing, especially now that they're kind enough to give us money to do it. I think now more than ever, um, people are hungry to read things. I mean, it's uh, been a kind of recurring theme on the podcast this year of just, number one, how much money people are make, making just by writing on the internet. Paid newsletters have sort of blown up. Um, people are getting subscribers faster than ever. And it's become almost like a trendy thing to be a thought leader and publish you know, your own podcast or your own paid newsletter, et cetera. But you've been doing this forever. I mean, up, even before you started interviewing IO, you were doing lots of research on why, why founders get hired, you know, what stands out on a resume and it's been tremendously popular because it's just a space where like the stakes are high and people really want to know what works. Well, I also think it's a space where like it. most, most other writers don't share data and graphs. Right. Um, I think that the reason people like my writing, it, like it's not necessarily the writing is that good necessarily. It's the fact that like I'm willing to peel back the curtain and just like do these painstaking experiments, um, which I love yeah. doing. Um, I think writing also gives you a nice mental break from like, at least with writing, it's something I can control. Like I know that if I put in uh, 40 hours, I will have something that's decent at the end. I've done this long enough now to kind of have a repeatable process with some of the other stuff we're doing on the product side, on selling. It's completely non-deterministic, right? Um, you could spend so much time on a feature and then, you know, doesn't work. And we, we've had a few losses like that, where I was sure this is, this is, you know, going to be the thing that, that changes everything. I've learned not to think that way anymore, because it's naive. And there's never a thing that changes everything. But um, writing, at least I'm like, hey, if I spend 40 hours on this, I know this many people will read it, and some of them will like it enough to share it. So give me an example of like, how you might put out something that you've written and why you're so certain that it would succeed and maybe like contrast that with an example of like a feature that you thought about building and you're so confident about it and it turns out it didn't go down the way that you planned. Yeah. Um, well, let's, th let's think. I'll, I'll use an example of something we wrote a while ago. Or no, I'll even talk about the thing that kind of put me on the map. This was many years ago, but even then when I hadn't written much, I kind of knew this would resonate. So 
I, back when I was, I was a software engineer for a time, then I switched to being a recruiter. And on my first recruiting job, uh, I decided that I would try to create the be all and end all like logistic regression uh, to sort of predict which resumes are going to end up as offers. So what does a, a winning resume look like? So I fed it with the resumes of everybody we had interviewed the year I was there and also with the resumes of people whom um, had joined the people who had joined the company previously. And um, I, I thought that this would be easy, right? Um, I think one mistake engineers make a lot um, when uh, working in a space that isn't engineering is, Hey, like if we just make the tech good, everything else will be great. We just need to optimize this thing. Um, you know, if, if we could just have like, lower latency, something or another, we'd have better government. Well, it's like, no, that's actually not <laughs> the, the, the engineering is not the hard part. And I, I fell into that. And um, it was hard to really get that much signal out of it. But I realized that one of the things that did carry signal was how many typos and grammatical errors a resume had. And of course, the, the fewer, the better. Um, right. Didn't matter where people went to school, um, didn't matter um, how senior they were. So uh, I did this big study kind of saying like a lot of the things we look at on resumes don't actually mean anything. And here are the few things that mean something. And um, I published that, uh, submitted it to Hacker News. I had a good feeling that that would do well because so many people are frustrated <laughs> by the way hiring works. And um, I felt like if I could arm people uh, with a little bit of data, uh, that backed up some of these uh, intuition, uh, some of these intuitive things they'd been feeling and thinking, um, then it would be a win. And in fact, that has been the formula uh, in my mind for uh, succeeding with an engineering audience. As you think about what do people believe, but um, that's controversial, but uh, don't necessarily have the evidence to back up. And if you can tell that story and just arm them with, you know, hopefully meaningful real, uh, thorough, uh, data, uh, about why their intuition was right. Um, then, then they'll respond to it. Um, that's different than feature development because features don't care. Right? <laughs> what were you going to say? Sorry. I was going to say, you've got a few, like a few different strong insights to kind of power your, your company with your content marketing. It's understanding that like people want these insights and that you have the data to provide them. And with your product, it's kind of understanding on both sides that like companies are looking to sort of they're looking for like these unfair advantages in hiring. And if there's some overlooked group of developers that they can hire who are actually really good, then that's like great for them. And developers are just looking for practice in like a safe way where they're not going to risk their ego or their reputation, and they can actually get practice. Um, but you know, out of all three of those, it seems like the the content one is probably the one that you're like the least, you know, double down on, right? It seems to be you who's writing the content. Have you ever thought about like building out a team and like making this a function of something that you do? Yeah. Um, well, we've had a few guest posts and our, our data scientist has written a few things that have been much more in depth than I think rigorous than anything I've ever written. Um, mine tend to be a little more off the cuff where I'm like, yeah, that's good enough. Um, not, not so in his. Uh, we actually have very likely uh, our first guest post in a while coming up soon because I think content is such a powerful machine. Um, historically, uh, it hasn't been the most high priority thing on my list and we haven't had the resources to grow a team around it. But now um, where it's becoming very, very clear that our product works, our unit economics work, and we probably just need more uh, people to come in at the top. Um, all of a sudden, content marketing is uh, a bigger and bigger part of that strategy. So uh, if we, it's something we thought about, haven't done it yet, but it's something we're, we're toying with. Um, one of the things that's been hard, though, about um, finding like a content person is um, there aren't that many people that write well um, and also have the domain expertise to have the right tone for the audience that we're trying to attract. Like... Um, I've talked to some content people and the last thing I want is, you know, top 10 things engineers do wrong in interviews or like, you know, <laughs> one weird trick to like make your penis bigger and make you better at algorithmic interviews. It's like, it's, it's not, you know, developers hate that developers stuff. hate it. Right. And, um, uh, I take a lot of this for granted because I'm part of the community and I used to be one and, you know, 
there are a lot of people that, that don't, they're like, okay, what programming languages are like, nobody cares, right? <laughs> like, nobody cares. You, you need to, to, to have something much more subtle, right? And much more thoughtful and like the second, third order stuff. So maybe, maybe I'm being a little bit too uh, prescriptive, but it's been hard to find someone. But I, I met somebody on the internet recently that I think is a great writer, and he's probably going to do some stuff for us. So we'll, we'll see how it pans out. I've dealt with kind of the same challenge at Indie Hackers, but in reverse, where like I find people who have domain expertise, but then they're not the best writers because they're like developers and founders. <laughs> and like that doesn't necessarily make you like great at expressing your ideas and telling a story in a way that readers actually care about. Yeah. And so I've been trying to work through this problem too. Well, what have you learned? Do you have any tips for me? <laughs> uh, I've been talking to a lot of people about it and just working through with Indie Hackers. And I think a lot of it, number one, just comes down to editing and sort of pairing people up. So you might not have, you know, one person who's good at both skills, but like if you kind of prioritize the domain expertise and you pair them with someone who's like, okay, well, I know how to tell a story, et cetera, and like work with them, which in any hacker's case often is me or my brother. I think that can often produce better and more entertaining stories and, and things that actually resonate and are meaningful rather than like are cheap, you know, like some like cheap listicle <laughs> or, or that are like overly, you know, they're sufficiently technical, but like are just not, or just like a, a drudge to read through. So that's kind of where I'm at, but that's I, like, I like talking about this stuff because it's very much a work in progress. Right? I don't know what the answer is, and you don't know what the answer no is. Idea. I think what, what's cool for listeners is most of them are in a place where they don't know how to grow their companies either necessarily. So I'm, I'm just curious, like, how do you model this whole challenge in your mind? Are you more of like, a, I need to find out what's working for another company and copy them, or I need to find out what's worked for us in the past and extend that? Like, How do you even know out of all the millions of possibilities what to even investigate as to how interviewing can grow in the future? Um, I've just, I've generally been a fan of just trying stuff quickly and then seeing if it works. There's so few cases where other people's advice has worked for me. Mostly I think because um, advice, unless it's somebody that really, really knows your situation is going to be this first order thing. Um, like reading advice blogs, isn't that useful most of the time? And um, you know, even, you know, some of our investors who, uh, are kind enough to give us advice, uh, don't have the full grasp of like what we're doing. Um, so I think the best thing is to just try stuff yourself. Um, one other thing back to the subject of content marketing that actually was surprising to me um, that I, I learned and helped me a lot is uh, last year, I wrote a few chapters in a book about recruiting. And that was one of the first times that I worked with a professional editor. And man, oh man, is that a gift? Like that is they're amazing. They're amazing, right? Um, and I've you know since just like used her on and off for my writing because uh, I can just vomit out a few drunken pages, clean them up a little, like make sure the data is correct once I sober up, and then I can just pass it to her. And she's like, "Hey, let's reorganize it this way. Did you mean this? Did and it, you know cuts it down." Um, that's, uh, I don't know if that's, that's useful for, for the audience, but that's, that's one of those things that I just, I didn't, for some reason, I had no faith that editors were good. I don't know why I thought this. I think I'm just cynical about everything. And I think that holds me back because I should probably take other people's advice more. <laughs> this is one of those situations <laughs> where I'm like, oh yeah, this is why this whole industry exists. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, I think if you're a founder in general, you're somebody who's pretty confident about your skills. You're someone who's uh, obviously pretty talented and it's, like just the whole dilemma of hiring in general is like you've got to find someone to do the thing that you're already good at. Like you've already written a bunch of hit viral blog posts and like how can you really put trust or faith in someone else to take part of what you know how to do really well and do it in your place. And a lot of it is like you have to just kind of like try it and dive in and like ideally find someone who's great. And the opposite can happen too. Like I've talked to so many founders who, who made like a bunch of bad hires and that just like solidified in their mind that like you can't hire, you can't outsource, you've got to do it all yourself. But man, when you work with something, someone really good, does it does it really change your thinking about how capable other people can be? Yeah, and it's like you know, it's easier in some domains than others. So uh, I trust our eng team implicitly because I like I was a decent engineer. I was never great, and like I haven't written code for this company for I don't know, like five years. Like I wrote some at the beginning, and then I hand it. Like I'm not going to meddle in what they're doing. I trust them, and they're they're they've shown over and over that like. I don't need to meddle and they know exactly what they're doing, but it's harder when it's something that you know how to do. Right. Um, one of my friends always used to say it's shitty being a designer in some ways, because 
Uh, design is one of those things that everybody thinks they know how to do because it's approachable, right? Unlike coding, yeah. well, you just don't know it. You don't know it. Great. The engineers get left in peace. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of topics like that where people think they're experts. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, they, and they aren't. And there's really no way to convince them that their design isn't good, that their thoughts on the economy like violate all the rules of economics that we know about. <laughs> lots, lots of stuff like that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Aileen, you've had quite a journey. I mean, you you faced basically certain death. You somehow managed to turn it into around the abyss. and get yeah. stared into the abyss, and you've returned uh, safely, and you're on the up and up. Uh, I know you said that you know your approach is that other people's advice hasn't worked out for you, but I think that's perhaps uh, my favorite prompt to ask you the question: What's your advice for people listening in? You know, you think people shouldn't necessarily take others' advice, uh, and yet you've you've got a lot of I think experience where probably some of the advice that you would share would be very helpful to some people listening in. So if someone's an indie hacker, they're trying to figure out how to survive during the recession or maybe come up with an idea from scratch, you know, what do you think they can take away from your journey, Aileen? Yeah. Um, well, I guess strategic advice is better than tactical because um, it's e- like broad strokes um, are, are less likely to be wrong. Um, I think the best thing that in hindsight, and we're not out of the woods yet, right? It, you know, we're, we're on the up and up. I hope we make it. Um, I'm, we're growing, but let's hope we keep it that way. But I think it's like too early for me to rest on my laurels and say, well, just uh, do what Aileen did and everything's going to be great. But, you know, things we, we did, we did, uh, 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 escape certain death and, um, we did have a pretty crazy, um, uh, redemption period. So if there's anything I learned from this, I think is, uh, make decisions fast. Um, you know, I'm so glad that we started looking into people uh, paying for interviews, even like before it was clear that COVID was here to stay. That gave us, um, I think, a month head start in some ways. And if we hadn't done that, we might have um, been much closer to running out of money. Um, so like make decisions fast. Um, I think that the other thing is... <clears throat> do your best to test things quickly um, and do it cheaply, right? Maybe it's emails, maybe it's something else. Uh, Just figure out what is uh, the best way I can get signal on whatever this question is. Um, If you're just starting a company, you know, in our case, when we first started, we threw up a really crappy marketing site and put it on Hacker News. And that was the test. But um, don't worry about the details. Just figure out what's the most basic question you can ask and try to get a validation and an answer for that as soon as you can. Um, and I don't know, in some ways, maybe this, this whole thing is a blessing because it really forces you to build a much more sustainable business than, than you could otherwise. And just because it's hard for you uh, doesn't mean it's not hard for other people. This is hard. This is something I remind myself. This is really, really hard for everybody right now, with the exception of maybe a few war profiteers whom I respect. But for the most part, um, everybody's struggling. Everybody's struggling. And I love the advice that you gave because it so parallels what you actually did. You know, you were scrappy when you first launched interviewing IO and Hacker News with just like a, a landing page, no product behind it. And you're scrappy even now when you had millions in revenue and a dozen employees, you're still just sending out these scrappy PayPal links and you hadn't built anything yet. I think way too many founders wait for their thing to be like perfect before they launch or perfect before they release. But if you can iterate quickly and cheaply and make decisions fast, then I think you'll be uh, much more likely to catch errors in your thinking and, and get on the right track sooner rather than later. Yeah, nothing Aileen, can be uglier for... than the emails we send out. So... <laughs> <laughs> take heart well, that's the bar that's you the can bar be, you can be as ugly as the, as the emails that Aileen sent out <laughs> Aileen thank you so much for coming on the show of course uh, can you tell listeners where they can go to find uh, what you're doing at interviewing IO you want me to tell them um, just go to yeah. interviewing go to interviewing dot IO <laughs> <laughs> it's so easy when your company name is your domain name. Well, it's a cr- blessing and a curse. <laughs> Thank you, Corlin. All right. Thanks, Aileen.